a yeah, reasonable bit of technical stuff thrown in a bit later. Um, and either this will speak to you from the point of view of reinforcing a perspective that perhaps um, testing, unit testing in particular, is um, something that you want to motivate yourself to do, or it reinforces the fact you are already doing it. Um, perhaps it will answer a couple of questions that are unclear, a couple of doubts in your mind. Um, it may also provide you with a couple of insights um, in terms of well, history, technique, uh, and um, points to make to other people. Um, people are often, often find themselves in discussions, technical discussions about practices uh, where they find themselves trying to explain to somebody else who's coming from a very different perspective um, why this stuff might make sense. So hopefully I'll, I'll hit at least a few of those uh, points. Um, so I'm Kevin Henney, um, and uh, I've got a stalking address and a spamming address there. Um, I've yeah, written some books, and uh, are these relevant? Uh, yeah, the one on the right's relevant. Um, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. This is a crowdsourced and open source book. Uh, very interesting thing is when I put out a call for submissions, uh, I got, a, I got a, a ridiculous number on testing. Um, there's a very high proportion of uh, submissions on testing. I couldn't take them all. Um, but it, uh, it, was, it was interesting um, uh, how that came out. And I'll refer to one or two of them a little bit later. Uh, now, this, uh, this is an interesting tweet I got from Kirk Pepperdine. Uh, he was one of the contributors to 97 Things. Um, uh, Kirk is a Java performance specialist, um, Canadian living in Hungary. Um, and he made an observation one day. He, he tweeted this one at me. Functionality is an asset. Code is a liability. Now, I found this absolutely fascinating and provocative because I spent the better part of my career convincing people that code is actually an asset. But he's right. He's dead right because what people want is the functionality. The code is somewhat annoying, the fact that there has to be code. But what he's saying is code is the liability, which means not that you don't care about it, but that you care about it very much. Because if it's a liability, you want less of it. You don't want loads of rubbish lying around. You don't want technical debt massing up. Because the more of this you have, the more likely it is that you will not be able to deliver on the functionality. So there's this wonderfully counterintuitive result that because code is a liability, you really care about it a very great deal, which kind of chimes with what I have been trying to uh, put forward, which is the idea of you really do have to care about the code at some level or another. But this idea is that in many systems you look and it's the code that is the liability. What people are buying is functionality. And then eventually what they're buying is slow delivery. And eventually they're, they're, they're taking, taking out government bonds in your technical debt. They want the functionality, but the code is the thing that gets in the way. Now, testing is not the only game in town, but there are a number of things that are going to help us. Um, I do also think it's worth thinking uh, about the observation code is a liability. Um, we need to understand our code. Um, bug report. Uh, this is actually the Norwegian for bug report. When I was giving a talk in uh, a series of talks in Norway, and I, I saw this, and I said, does this say what I think it says? Because the great thing is in English, bug rapport means kind of understanding your bugs, being at one with your bugs, having a communication with your bugs, like this. Um, this is PowerPoint, about to lose my work. Uh, what, I, what is fascinating about bugs is that certain classes of bugs at the level of a software product reveal a great deal about the internal structure. They also reveal not just the internal structure of a product. They reveal questions of architecture and practice and organizational technique. Let's, let's look at this one. Um, first thing that's most obvious, Microsoft Visual C++ runtime library. So PowerPoint 
is compiled using Microsoft Visual C++. In other words, Microsoft eat their own dog food, which I've never been fond of as a phrase. It's something of an American phrase. I believe the Swiss talk about eating their own chocolate, which I think I'm more in favor of. Okay? But this idea, they actually use their own compilers on their own products. This is not what they used to do. In the 1990s, they used different compilers. And it's a very interesting feedback cycle that when they started using their own compilers on their own products, their compilers got better. Yeah, because you have, you'd have, you'd have the operating system guys and, and the uh, applications guys going, this isn't as good as Whatcom. You know, you guys really need to tighten this up. Um, so the first thing is we discover it is written in C++. It is, written, it is compiled using Microsoft's um, C++ compiler. Um, then the next thing we might notice is it's a pure virtual function call. This is curious. Pure virtual function call is an abstract method being invoked. How do you invoke a pure abstract method? How can that be possible? Um, there are one or two cases where it is possible. Um, it means you've either, you've either, uh, you're either not running a static analysis tool or you've got a memory trampling bug. Now, I don't know which one of these it is, but I now have a question. I can now go into the code base and say, well, okay, what are we missing? Could we have caught this at compile time? Is it a case of turning out the warning levels higher or running a separate static analysis tool? Or is this a runtime error in the sense of a memory error? Either way, I'm learning something about the development practices. Either these guys need to work with higher warning levels or they need to take a little more care over the encapsulation of memory management. However, I think the most revealing thing here is, let's just be clear, what is the application that is crashing? PowerPoint. And where is the failure being reported? Internet Explorer. Oh. I, I don't remember running Internet Explorer. I, you know, Internet Explorer is the browser I use to download Chrome. Yeah? So what's going on here? Um, what we're learning here is that the rendering engine that is being used typically for panels down the left the rendering engine used is part of Internet Explorer. And although Microsoft talk the component talk, they don't walk the component walk. In other words, if I want to have that rendering engine, I have to have the whole of Internet Explorer. Whatever happened to componentization? Where's my little rendering component .dll? Yeah? In other words, um, uh, which also explains the memory footprint of PowerPoint. So there's an interesting thing here. In failure, a software system reveals itself. It loses its encapsulation. It shows you as it breaks apart not only the parts, but also it raises questions about the practices. I've got a collection of these things. Um, people send me them now. It's got to the point people will now actually send me these. I retweet them on my uh, Twitter stream. Um, I love this one, uh, IKEA. Um, so there we have, hmm, yeah. Java.lang.string plus the hash code. Did you find what you were looking for? No, I don't think so. So now I know that IKEA use Java for this. I also know that this particular printer product uses C. So assertion failed. OK, so for C programmers, it's not too bad. I mean, they've kind of not, they've actually used vowels. A lot of C programmers don't believe that vowels exist and they rip them out of their names. Um, but it failed at line 702. Mm, that's, not, that's not massive. I've seen longer, but that, do, that doesn't make me feel too good. That's, I think that's a little bit long. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm learning something about the product. I, I've got a whole collection of these. I'll be using them in subsequent talks. Um, so there is, a, there is an observation here that comes from um, Andy Hunt and Dave uh, Thomas in Pragmatic Programmer. It's a lovely little mantra, test early test often, test automatically. If it's such a good idea, why do it last? If it's such a good idea, why do it just once? But if you're going to do it a lot, you might want to, you might want to take, uh, take some time to automate it. Now, there's, some, there's a very interesting thing. Um, I, I, I still find this, and I find this with some agile teams as well, that there will be a little, there's a little betrayal of what people actually mean, what they're thinking. Um, they will say things like, yep, we're agile, and then they will accidentally slip in. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah, and then there's the testing phase. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so in a traditional sequential development life cycle, like the waterfall, where does testing come? Where is it? Right, yeah, right after the development. In fact, actually, that betrays a very interesting perspective. I'm going to come back to that one. It's right at the end, isn't it? Let's forget all about software development for a moment. Let's just think we are making a thing. If I put the testing phase right at the end, right at the end, in other words, the next thing is, this goes out the door. What am I expecting when I go into the testing phase? It's working. Yeah? Otherwise, I wouldn't put it at the end. Now, this is a, this is a big surprise to a lot of people because they never think of it like this. In other words, it's one of these things that if I knew nothing about software development, culture, or anything like that, if I took a step back and said, ah, oh, you're creating a thing, you're creating an artifact, and the last thing you do is test, you must be expecting it to work because otherwise it wouldn't be the last thing you did. There is nothing after that. So there's this very interesting idea that it's a separated thing, but logically, if you put it at the end, you are expecting it to work. Now, sometimes when I ask that question, and then interestingly enough, I get this from both developers and managers, they'll say, oh, well, we're expecting it not to work. And I said, well, if you were expecting it not to work, why did you leave it so late? If you're expecting it not to work, you'd have, you'd have got down to it and sorted it out earlier. And then one of the other key questions that I ask is what actually dominates such a testing phase? in software development. Now, we use this word testing. Testing has a very honorable feel to it. It's a very positive thing. But what actually goes on in a testing phase at the end of a life cycle? What is the, one of the dominant activities? I'm going to give you a clue. It's not testing. What are we spending a lot of time doing? Fixing. Now, imagine if you submitted a plan, given that this, this lives in a plan-driven world. You submitted a plan, and you said to your, uh, you said to your, uh, uh, your uppers, you know, there you go. It's going to be, here's the testing and fixing phase, or the fixing phase. Let's just call it the fixing phase. It's, people would feel a little awkward about that. It doesn't sound quite so good. We're going we're to create something broken, and then we're going to try and fix it. And if the wind is in the right direction, and luck is on our side, it'll be out the door. All working, fixed. So, why are you, so the question has to be, why are you going to create it broken? Now, there is another challenge here. This goes back to this um, common mental model that testing is somehow separate from development. In other words, here is development, and then here is testing. We, I, I, I live in Bristol, in the UK. Bristol, um, one of the things we have in Bristol is Airbus. One of the... One of the uh, uh, well, it's one of the major Airbus sites. Um, and um, I can't remember which bit of the Airbus A380 they built. I can't remember if it's the wings. I think it's the wings. Um, but I'm fairly sure that one of the things they don't do by the time they actually attach the wings onto the fuselage, they don't sort of sit there and go, well, it should probably work. By the time they reach that point, they have an immensely high level of confidence that this stuff works. And they, these are, this is the largest wingspan of any commercial um, craft. It's about 79 meters, tip to tip, and it's only attached to the fuselage by about 30 centimeter um, uh, overlap. By the time they get there, they're not sitting there going, ah, well, we think it kind of works. They have every reason to believe that it will work. And the reason they do this, because it turns out that even in industrial processes where there is a test phase at the end, it's not the only test phase, it's the last one. They have every reason to believe it will work because what they've been doing during development is testing. In other words, this is our final check it before it goes out the door thing. But we've got to that point, and we are absolutely sure that it, it works. So this kind of informs a very different perspective. The idea is that it may be that customers want another check of something. It may be that there is a, a reason, particularly with um, cross-disciplinary work where you're dealing with hardware and software, it may be there is a reason that you want to do something at the end just to do this reality check before it goes out the door. 
Of course, if you're doing a more frequent deployment, then you're going to try and make that more automatic. But the idea is in either case, you want to have every confidence that you know what the answer is going to be. It should be a failure is a surprise and an exception and not the norm. Now, given that, there is this interesting question. What is it that developers think they do? So what do programmers believe they do? The reason I ask this is because one of the most common objections to spending more time unit testing is it's going to take me more time. Yeah, it's, this is going to slow me down. It's going to take me more time. This is all to do with, this, this all comes out of a, a curious belief that what programmers believe they do is write code. There's this idea, people have this idea, this fantasy in their head, I write code for a living. Oh, and then there might be other stuff, but I write code for a living. Writing code is what I do. If you get me to write anything else, if I'm writing these tests, I'm writing less code by definition. When you actually look at what programmers do, they spend most of the time reading code, debugging it, searching the web, going to meetings, discussing things, wrestling with the build system, drinking tea, coffee, or whatever caffeinated drink um, drives them to the, through their code. They copy and paste an awful lot, based on my experience. Uh, and somewhere, somewhere down there, they write code. There is this mental image, this idea that you have of yourself, this self-image. I write code, and then there's other stuff. No, there's other stuff, and then if you're really lucky, you might write some code. Or there's another way of looking at it. All this other stuff is writing code. That is what you do. That's what takes... Um, uh, now, I had this wonderful insight. Um, I was running a training course at uh, <coughs> a bank in London, and I got into the, I got into the lift. <sighs> Let me think, what day was this? Wednesday. One developer talking to another. Oh, I really hope I get to write some code today. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Monday was just like all meetings and stuff like that. Yesterday I was firefighting and doing stuff like that. And so far, you know, today is looking like it might, you know, he'd been in since six o'clock. You know, it's, uh, I think I might get some code done today. It turns out writing code is almost anomalously rare. And so the idea that writing tests is somehow going to reduce the amount of code written is first of all a little bit of a fantasy. It's based on an ideal view of your own self-perception. And we are very bad when it comes to perceiving ourselves. Your own mental image of yourself is probably 10 years younger and a lot more attractive. Yeah, am I right? Yes, I think so. Yeah? And the same for your code and the amount of time you spend coding. Your code is pristine and awesome. If only you didn't have to work on that legacy code base, then all of your programming goodness would be unleashed upon the world. It would be fantastic. If only you could spend more time coding. Uh, sadly, that's not really what goes on. So here's, here's a sort of a, a slightly different agenda. Read code, test, search the web, write code, drink tea, coffee, etc. It turns out that when we actually look, uh, and this, this applies for um, test driven, test after, and when people write tests, something very interesting happens. They write less code. It's true, they do. Which is obviously not what some people want to hear. Um, yes, all the studies demonstrate people write less code. Um, they write less code to do the same functionality. They write less code with fewer bugs. In other words, functionality is the asset, code is the liability. You reduce your liability. So it's an interesting perspective. Now, whenever I present this, one of the inevitable things that happens is somebody says, if, I, if I've got a manager in the room, there's normally a case of, well, what can we do to supervise this or control it? There's a fear that people will spend their whole time testing. Now, I have heard of a couple of projects where that has happened. But it's such a luxury to have. I mean, if that's a, that's a problem you want to have. You know, so, so sometimes people say, well, look, what happens if my developers start writing just tests all the time? And there's loads and loads of tests. I said, tell you what, get back to me when you have that problem. If you have that problem, you will be, you know, that's a luxury to have, but it's so rare. So there's all this sense I should control this. So my answer is what should they do to constrain these activities and control them and supervise them? Nothing. It should be treated as a 
um, development practice, a standard development practice, like compiling. I don't, I don't see that other people get involved in the Compilation Act. You know, people wandering around going like, well, how many times have you compiled today? I think you, you're using up your compilation quota. Yeah, you can compile any time you want. So, here's some motivation. Clean code that works. Ron Jeffrey's pithy phrase. This is quoting from um, Kent Beck's Test Driven Development by Example, which is now ooh, 10 years old. Um, it's the goal of TDD. Clean code that works is a worthwhile goal for a whole bunch of reasons. It is a predictable way to develop. You know when you're finished without having to worry about a long bug trial. It's not perfectly predictable. If things were perfectly predictable, I, I suspect that the world would be a very different place. But there is a certain level of confidence that comes with that. In other words, there's, you're reducing the element of surprise. Gives you a chance to learn all of the lessons the code has to teach you. This is something else that we need to consider. Code, code is an expression of knowledge. When people talk about software developers as knowledge workers, they kind of forget that there's a real side to this. It means you have to know stuff. You have to learn stuff. You have to learn not simply programming languages and libraries. You have to learn about the domain. You have to learn about the architecture. How am I expressing this? Is this the best way to do this? Um, you know, and the observation, if you only slap together the first thing you think of, you never have time to think of a second better thing. There's another interesting thing. If you're writing code to test your code, you have, you're, you have a very privileged perspective. You're the first person to use that code. What does that feel like? Does it feel convenient? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Is it awkward? Um, this is a really subtle point because a lot of people think that the goal of testing is merely to find bugs. I started the talk considering bugs. But it turns out that's not really the whole thing. I also considered the fact that code is a liability. It's not just the bugs. I mentioned technical debt and other issues. There is this idea that part of the goal of testing is not simply um, quantitative feedback. You have five uh, test failures. That's quantitative. There is a qualitative feedback. The very act of writing a test gives you a little bit of feedback on level of awkwardness in the code. Um, it's, it's one of the kind of first points where you get some feedback. I think there's a, uh, there's a, a lovely example. I did a code review with a company a few years ago. And a uh, lovely example of a method that had five Boolean arguments. If you're inside the method, it actually looks OK, because they're all, it's all very well named. You know, if you've got one Boolean argument um, uh, named is enabled, um, another Boolean argument is active and stuff like that. When you read the method, it's actually quite readable. If is enabled, then do something. If is active, then do something. It looks very readable. On the outside, though, what does this method look like when you call it? True, true, false, false, true. True, false, false, true, false. How readable is that? It's when you start, when you use your own code, when you eat your own dog food, so to speak, when you are actually trying it out, you kind of get a little feedback. It's like, well, you know what? That's not so smart. That doesn't look so clean. You're forced into this point of observation. Um, and I, I've, I've certainly in the past thrown away um, a number of tentative designs simply by writing tests for them. This is really awkward. This is difficult to use. You know what? If I think it's difficult to use and this is my baby, what are the other guys going to think? So there's, there's a, a key observation there. It improves the lives of the users of your software. There's a sociological aspect here as well. People, other people, lets your teammates count on you and you on them. It also feels quite good to write it. When you get into the swing of writing tests, there is a, a certain satisfaction um, uh, that comes from doing that. So there's another thing that we want to be careful of here. The term TDD has suffered some kind of semantic drift over time and a little bit of sem uh, semantic dilution. Uh, dilution. Um, Alistair Coburn made this observation. Very many people say TDD when they really mean I have good unit tests. I have guts. I like this term guts. This is good. Ron Jeffries, um, one of the original XPers, also mentioned in the previous slide, tried for years to explain what this was, but we never got a catchphrase for it, and now TDD has been watered down to mean guts. Um, in other words, 
Sometimes a team or an individual will claim to be doing test-driven development, and whilst it's certainly true that they are doing unit testing, they may not strictly be doing TDD. And whilst they're producing good unit tests, again, it may not strictly be TDD. It's worth keeping in mind that TDD is a very specific um, class of practices. Um, but the objective, good unit tests, it turns out there's many ways to arrive at good unit tests. Now, what about the history of TDD? Most people cite um, Kent Beck and um, extreme programming. This is, the, this is where TDD took off. The test first programming idea, this is where it became popularized and exercised and practiced. In other words, this is where it matured. And primarily in the Java world, subsequent to that, is where, if you like, TDD grew up. It's where it moved out of childhood into adolescence and into maturity. But actually, it turns out that TDD has a much longer prehistory. But it just simply wasn't advocated or um, referred to as a distinct practice in its own right. I came across this interview a few years ago um, with Alfred Aho. Uh, Alfred Aho is known for his compiler work, um, his data structures and algorithms work, and he's the A in ORC, Aho Weinberger Kernigan. Lovely little language if you've never uh, worked with it. And in this interview, they're asked, would you do anything differently in the development of ORC looking back? And he responds, one of the things I would have done differently is instituting rigorous testing as we started to develop the language. We initially created ORC as a throwaway language. Yeah, that's never happened in software before. You know, it's sort of, here's a patch. It's only, in, it's, it's only a, a stop gap. We'll, we'll do it right for the next release. Um, and that becomes your next release. So we didn't do rigorous quality control as part of our initial implementation. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that there was a person who wrote a CAD system in ORC. Now, I'm just going to pause there. Has anybody used ORC? Right. What's the longest script you've ever written? 50 lines, yeah. And I, you know, I'm a big advocate of the language. I might have hit 100 lines. To write a CAD system, you have to be, you, it's kind of, your, you, it's one of those things, you'd be slightly impressed, but also slightly concerned. You know, it's just like, wow, you did that. Um, so the reason he initially came to see me was to report a bug in the ORC compiler. He was very testy with me, saying I had wasted three weeks of his life. Now, when somebody walks into you and they've been mad enough, walks into your office and they've been mad enough to write a whole CAD system in ORC, and then they say, you wasted three weeks of my life, you pay attention. So um, I held up with Brian Kerning after this, and we agreed we really needed to do something differently in terms of quality control. So we instituted a rigorous regression test for all the features of ORC. Any of the three of us, Aho, Weinberger, Kernigan, who put in a new feature into the language from then on, first had to write a test for the new feature. There you go, TDD, 1970s. It turns out it does have a long prehistory. Um, it's another example here um, that relates to it. Um, Alan Perlis, uh, recipient of the first Turing Award, if I remember correctly. I'd like to read three sentences to close this issue. A software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of used after the design. Oh, OK. A simulation which matches the requirements contains the control which organizes the design of the system. Now, it's not immediately obvious what that is, but um, Glenn Vandenberg pointed this one out to me that um, uh, that's mock objects. Through successive repetitions of this process of interlaced testing and design, the model ultimately becomes the software system itself. And the key of this approach has been suggested. There's no such question as testing things after the fact, etc., etc., etc. 1968. The original software engineering conference. Apparently, back in 1968, they had a clue what software engineering was, but in 1969, it all went downhill. I spoke to somebody a couple of years ago, um, and she was describing a, um, the work she used to do in the 1980s um, for a particular company, and she was describing uh, test-first development. It was uh, test-first programming. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, and the reason that she did it was because of a lack of confidence. She was, all her colleagues seemed so very, very confident of their code. Um, just as, just as a, one of those clues in life, confidence doesn't mean you're right. But human beings, we like confidence in others, and we think that they're right when they're confident. It's, it's deep in our wiring. And so her colleagues seemed to be very, very confident about their code. 
She felt more reticent about this, and as a result, she adopted a test-first approach because she was never so sure that her code was going to work. So what she'd do is she'd write some tests. She'd write a little test first. She'd write some code, make sure that that worked, write another test, write some code. Just make In other words, her confidence derived from a more empirical approach. But she didn't tell any of her colleagues this because she thought it felt stupid. Yeah? Whereas actually, it turns out it's quite a good idea for exactly the reasons um, that she described. Now, um, observation from Nat Price and Steve Freeman. Everybody knows TDD stands for test-driven development. That's actually not true. I did have a conversation with a very, very smart developer five years ago when I mentioned TDD, and he said, what, top-down design? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so that's not necessarily true. However, people too often concentrate on the words test and development and don't consider what the word driven really implies. For tests to drive development, they must do more than just test the code performs its required functionality. They must clearly express that required functionality to the reader. Now, this is uh, interesting. This, this is the blurb from a um, conference session that Nat and Steve did at XP Day in London in 2007. Um, they, and this was a very interesting session. Sadly, I couldn't go to it. I love the blurb. Um, but they did something else in the session. What they did is they got people to implement simple toy problems in pairs. They handed out simple problem descriptions on index cards. People in pairs would solve it. Write code and tests, write code and tests. And there were different problems being solved in the room. Once you had written your code and tests, you passed your tests to another pair without the card and without the code. And now what they had to do is implement code that satisfied the tests. Now, I know I've written, <laughs> when I think of some of the tests that I've written, I'm, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I would not be happy with this. Because although I tested that the code kind of did what it was supposed to, I did not make very clear in the tests what the code was supposed to do. It's quite a challenge. Could I actually hand off my test to somebody else and have that treated as a specification? Now, this is a, an interesting point because um, when many people sort of respond to the question, you know, why are you testing your code? What reasons would I have to test my code? People often respond along the lines of to test that it is correct, to test that it does the right thing, to test that it works. But it turns out that that's not actually a good response because that only pushes the problem one step back. The question is, what do you mean by it works? What do you mean by it is correct? It turns out understanding what on earth it is you're trying to do is far harder sometimes than actually testing it, expressing the intent of the code. They must be clear specifications of the required functionality. Um, now, sometimes people will say, well, immediately that I need a particular testing framework to do this with and so on. No, no, no. This is really to do with the sensibility of how you test. So um, let's, uh, yeah, let me, let me just uh, take a, a, minor detour from the, uh, a minor detour from the slides. Um, and let's see, we've got, uh, uh, that's, that's up there like that. That's good. Um, what I'd like to do is just explore a very simple example and the way that most people would go about testing it. Um, sadly, I don't have any cups, so I'm just going to steal a glass here. Thank you very much. Right. Well, we'll just call that a cup for the sake of argument. And we are going to develop a cup class. How hard could that be? And if we start out in this kind of way, many programmers will sketch it. That will do that. And, well, I guess we'll have some kind of constructor. And I guess we'd like to know uh, if it's empty or not. And I guess we would like to be able to fill it. That makes a certain amount of sense. I guess we'd also like to be able to drink from it. Okay. And somewhere in there, 
there'll be some private implementation, and I guess there's probably going to be other methods as well. So, how are we going to go about testing this? Okay, so the way that a lot of people will do this, and indeed not just people, and this is the fascinating thing, is it's not just, um, it's not just people that do this, uh, it's also uh, automated tools. So the way a lot of people go about this is to write something like cup tests, cup test. And then they will do something that is obvious and intuitive and really wrong. And Eclipse does this for you. In fact, many environments will do this for you. This is the great thing about code generation. It allows you to generate the wrong thing faster. Yeah? So a lot of, a lot, most code generation out there is just not worth the paper it isn't printed on. It's just shockingly bad. We're going to do the wrong thing, and we're just going to make it easier for you to do the wrong thing. So, um, and what is it that they're going to do? What they're going to do here is they're going to do this. They're going to go along these lines. We're going to do something like test constructor and you can see it's a very simple way of generating it test is empty and what else I guess there's going to be a test um, what have we got next fill Okay, so we've got the as I said, this is really obvious because what you have is a one for one alignment. Now it's going to be really kind of interesting. How how are we going to write these? So let's go up to this. And I will go ahead and do something like New cup equals new cup. Okay, so what am I going to test? I mean, I've got a new cup now. What, what, what are we going to do? What's the purpose of this test? Do I need to put an assertion in, or am I going to leave it like that? And if I'm going to put an assertion in, what am I going to assert? So, Here's what a lot of people will try and assert. And they feel satisfied with this because they've now, so it's one of those things, sometimes you kind of look at, I need a thing to assert. Look, what can I assert? I've got a reference, fantastic, it shouldn't be null. Why, why don't we want to write this? What's wrong with this? Yeah, and this is um, Karl Popper, a philosopher of the 20th century, gave us what we now use as a working definition of a scientific theory. A scientific theory is one that is falsifiable. In other words, it is possible that I can contrive an experiment that, if it yielded a false result, would contradict my theory, and thus I would know my theory is not true. In other words, I can do something to demonstrate that it doesn't work. And the problem is, the only way I can make this fail is by hacking the JVM. And I think that's a little bit naughty because we're trying to write a cup. Okay? There are no circumstances in which this will actually... If new fails, we bomb out with an exception. If the constructor fails, we bomb out with an exception. We'll never reach a point where that is actually not null. This is just a fancy way of saying assert true, true. Um, now, it's not just this one, because it's not just, this is a very obvious one, but I do find a lot of test cases where people will assert things that are true of the platform. In other words, there's no case that would ever result in false except if the platform is broken. And it's entirely possible, when, I, when I'm referring to platform, I'm also referring to middleware and standard libraries and things like that. It is possible that these things break, but that's not the job of the cup tests to check. Yeah? That's a separate set of tests. If you actually have this as an issue, then these are conformance tests. 
Yeah? If, you, if you require a particular behavior from a third-party library and you know that that third-party library is a little bit ropey, then maybe you have a separate set of conformance tests. In other words, that defines your precondition. But it's nothing to do with the cup. It's conformance tests on that. So there's a scope issue, which now leaves us with nothing to test, sadly. Now, sometimes people will say, well, it's OK, because what you're actually doing is you're asserting that the cup constructor doesn't throw. That, that is certainly true. But I feel a little uncomfortable with that, because it hasn't really tested the constructor. It's tested something very specific about the constructor. It's testing that the constructor does not throw, which is not the same as testing all of the behavior of the constructor. The name, the name suggests we're testing the behavior of the constructor. But we're actually only testing one thin slice of it. We're testing that it doesn't throw. Now, at this point, we suddenly realize, you know what, there is something we could test. And I'm expecting it's entirely reasonable that a new cup is empty. Okay, so we've got that. Right. So that seems not unreasonable until we come to the next method. Oops. Which seems uncannily familiar. We've kind of already tested this behavior. Now, sometimes what people will do is delete the test case for test is empty. But wait a moment, it's a Boolean. The last I checked, Booleans have two values. We've only demonstrated that it returns true. So, And you know what? I'll get rid of that. So we're going to fill the cup, because we already know that the emptiness case works, because that was covered in the previous case. We're going to fill the cup, and we're going to assert that it's not empty. Heck, we may even spell that correctly. Um, so we're going to do that. Now, that's kind of interesting, because in order to deal with that, we've just had to use fill. But test fill is the next method. So what are we going to do here? We've already kind of tested fill. Well, this does raise the interesting question of what happens if you take a cup that's already filled? What happens if you fill it again? Do you get an overflow exception? Yeah, so let's test that. That seems entirely reasonable. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a filled cup and we're going to fill it again. I think we're going to go for the idea that there should be an overflow exception. Um, But I'm increasingly uncomfortable with this because, again, I haven't really tested fill. I've tested an edge case of fill. I've tested the, the, main, the main common use of fill was actually tested in the previous test method. So this one doesn't really work. And then, and then we end up with drinking. Let's fill a cup. Let's drink from it. And then um, assert that the cup is empty. 
that seems to be okay. But then we realize there's another edge case of drink. What happens when you drink from an empty cup? I'm going to say that that's okay. You're just going to feel very unsatisfied. But I'm, I don't regard that as a problematic behavior. That's not a negative test case. So a lot of developers will then kind of sneak this one in. They'll go, oh, okay, right. Well, what we'll do is we'll just say that that's okay. Now, I look at this and I've got, in this test case, I've got two cases. And they kind of mash together. It's very difficult to work out what's really being, there's two things. This is sort of a, I'm, I'm testing subtly that that's okay. But it's a very subtle thing. If I look at this without knowing what our pre, uh, the discussion we've just had, I'm going to look at that and go, why on earth is, why on earth is he writing drink and then fill and then drink? What possible purpose could this serve? And again, we have that really subtle case of I'm trying to test that it doesn't throw, but I'm not really saying as such. Now, when you look back over all of these test cases, you can see that this alignment, this one for one, is completely dysfunctional. It is actually a bad testing style, but it is the most common testing style. We've ended up with cases of behavior being, uh, cases of dominant behavior, the fill behavior, the main common day use of fill is not tested in the test fill. That's an edge case of it, or a negative case. Half of emptiness is tested in one case, but the name is empty, test is empty, actually suggests um, that all of the is empty behavior is tested somewhere else. But it's not. Only half of it is. And that actually involves fill, which is... And then I've got this final test case, which actually tests two things, one of them very subtly. Well, it's a mess. And this is because it lacks cohesion. You know, the, the criteria for cohesion for a test is slightly different to the criteria of cohesion for an ordinary method, which is unsurprising because they, the purpose of a test is different. It cuts across, it's a usage, it cuts across a class interface. Now, if we go back and start saying, well, what were we actually saying? Are we testing the, oh yes, we can really screw this one up as well. If I get rid of the constructor, because I'm using field initializers, or initializer blocks, then it's likely I would never write the test constructor case. <coughs> what we're actually doing is testing construction, or we're testing an initial state. And if I ask somebody, please tell me what's going on here, what are you doing in your test constructor? Well, what I'm doing is I'm testing that new cups are empty. Well, that's very different. Why didn't you say that? In other words, it goes back to the time-honored... Uh, in other words, say what you mean. If you meant to say, we're testing that newcomers are empty, why hide behind this veil of test constructor? If you meant to say, test the new cup is empty, then go ahead. And it's a lot clearer. If I wanted to have the case that new cups should, if I, for whatever reason I wanted to emphasize, let's just say we'd had a bug report against cups that were, that threw exceptions in their constructors, then I would introduce a new test case, test that new cups do not throw exceptions. Very simple. Um, now, you'll notice something else I've done there, which is a, a, a kind of a subtle thing. Um, I'm, go, I'm about to get rid of the test um, prefix. Um, JUnit3 requires it, uh, PyTest requires it, if I remember correctly, Groovy still requires it. Uh, a number of testing frameworks require that you prefix your test cases with the word test. Uh, I think this is, uh, I've, as far as I'm concerned, we've already got it prefixed with the word test, at test, it's a bit of a giveaway. Um, it's just noise words. Um, I, I don't find that there's a great deal of value to it. Uh, but there is a practice here that is worth emphasizing. If you are going to use a test prefix, never ever use test on its own. Always use test that. For the simple reason that 
grammatically in English, test that requires you to um, place a full sentence after it. Okay? In other words, test, you can't just test that constructor. What, that one there? You have to test that constructor does something. Or test that initial state is. You have to test that something is the case. You have to test that when I do this, that follows. So there's this idea of test that as a, a useful linguistic trick of forcing you into writing a proposition rather than simply writing an imperative. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to do that, then I, I'll leave it as that. Uh, I had an interesting one with a, a, um, a group, uh, a group of C programmers at a company. We wrote, um, the term test has a great deal of baggage associated with it. It's one of the reasons, for example, that behavior-driven development actually shies away from the vocabulary of testing. Uh, the, the terminology of testing has associations for many people. And that was certainly the case um, with the C programmers. So we basically changed the approach. I basically said during the course, let's just call it require that. In other words, I want you thinking in terms of requirements. Require that this is the case. And that turned out to be very helpful to the point that actually that team kept that as a practice afterwards. Um, I prefer the brevity of a new cup is empty. Uh, if you come across BDD, there's this emphasis on use of the word should. Now, I, I'm going to say that I'm not particularly wild about this, but if it helps you get this style of testing, then I'm all in favor of it. Um, but as you can see, uh, it's, let's put it this way, um, I've noticed this particularly in Java. Um, uh, in some programming languages and cultures, there is a problem with the brevity of names. This does not appear to be a problem in Java, where people are quite happy to sort of say, well, to read my code, you will need an HD screen, preferably a double-headed monitor, because the line goes over both monitors. Uh, anything that can save Java programmers from writing these ridiculously long names that they sometimes write where you end up with factory controller, process manager, blah, 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 and then the thing that it actually does, um, I think is a great help. So for me, if I have to put should be, then that's one extra word, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a noise word. Um, most, most writing guidelines tell you to avoid using um, sort of equivocal language like should. Is it or isn't it? Make up your mind. Tell me. It should be empty. Mm, you know what? It either is or it isn't. And you need to state that that's a requirement. I can challenge this requirement, and new cup is empty. I may say, no, 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 our cups come pre-filled. That's great. But the should, when, that test, when this test fails, then I immediately know what the problem is. So this is what I refer to as propositional style naming, because it is a proposition. A new cup is empty. That is a proposition. It is either demonstrated, it is either true or false. If that test fails, I immediately know from the name what is wrong. I might not know why, but I know what. A new cup is empty. Well, apparently it isn't. Okay, you can just tell by the negation of the name. If you say a new cup should be empty, you know what? If it isn't empty, we're saying the use of the word should suggests that it's okay to not be empty. You know, where are my keys? They should be on the table. Immediately suggests that it's okay if they're not. We're admitting the possibility that they might not be on the table. I don't really want that from my tests. It'd be great if we replaced all the programming language structures uh, instead of if and else and all the rest of it. You know, perhaps and possibly. And, you know, it's okay if it doesn't. And there may be. You know, I think it would make an interesting experiment. How, so I'm going to say if should helps you, go for it. On the other hand, yes. Um, that, again, there's, there's a whole load of little naming tricks that people use um, to help them. <laughs> achieve a certain consistency. I'm, I'm sort of for them as a kind of a starting point, but I find that some of them hold you back. I'll look at an example in a moment um, that kind of holds you back. So uh, um, sometimes we actually find that it forces you into a slightly false style of English. It doesn't allow you to say what you want to say. On the other hand, again, if it's one of those habits that helps you, then I'm all for it. 
Yeah. Um, yes, I think that, that I think that, that that can be the case, but I don't think it's necessarily. I, I'm I'm kind of interested in a, more, a broader view. Let, I'll, I'll look at another example in a moment. Um, sort of say, well, here's where it might not work quite as effectively. But on the whole, I have no major problem with that, except I have seen some people use the it style, and they end up with really convoluted English. In other words, in order to fit the it, they've had to rearrange everything else in, into something that's a bit clunky. And quite frankly, I'm bored of stacks. Um, they get, you know, after you've been doing objects for a few years and you've seen a few stack examples and test-driven development, yeah, it's a few stack. It gets really quite boring. Recently used lists are much more exciting um, because a recently used list is like your recently opened files menu. It is like a stack. The most recent item goes to the head. It has indexing, um, but you also require uniqueness. In other words, when you reopen a file in your recently opened files list, it goes to the head rather than... Um, rather than ending up occurring twice. So it is like a stack and it is like a set. It has two properties, so it's a little more interesting. Um, now, obviously, based on what we've just done, we know that this is not the right way of going about it. Um, and the way we would like to think about it, uh, 97 things, I got, um, I got a really nice contribution from Gerard Mazaros. Uh, now, Gerard wrote uh, X-unit test patterns which is about a thousand pages long. It's um, quite a hefty book. It has a lot in it, obviously. Uh, but it's one of those books that if you can't convince your colleagues by the skill and wisdom of your argument, just hit them around the head with it, because a thousand pages weighs an awful lot. You know, Gerard said so, so that's okay. Um, that's a lot of tree. Anyway, I got him down to about 500 words for this. Um, write tests for people. First of all, you're writing tests for people rather than for machine execution. But there's another observation here. Who should you be writing the test for? For the person trying to understand your code. Notice that Gerard says, for the person trying to understand your code, not for the person trying to understand your tests. Because good tests act as documentation for the code they are testing. They describe how the code works for each usage scenario. Each test case is a case of usage. It's not, you know, so where you find that you are testing multiple cases, then that's not a test case. And what you want to do is this three-part rule. Describe the context, the starting point, the preconditions that must be satisfied. Illustrate how the software is invoked, and then describe the expected results, the post conditions to be verified. Um, sometimes this is referred to as the, um, historically, the three A's, arrange, act, assert. Uh, but it corresponds very nicely with the BDD given, when, then, which I tend to find a, a more useful way of um, expressing this. So given a particular situation, when you perform a particular action, then there is a particular outcome. If we go, so if we look at um, the recently used list tests, do this as C sharp and N unit. This is one of the other things when people focus on this more literate style of testing, they automatically assume that they need a special framework for it. You don't need it. You can do it even with just asserts, raw language asserts if you need to. It is the sensibility. Uh, I, I tend to find that a lot of people often take on a framework, they have no idea what they're doing, and now they don't have any idea what they're doing with a more powerful framework. It helps to know what you're doing. You want to be able to express yourself. What is the means of that expression? Uh, so, to emphasize the real aspect, so I've used namespaces and uh, fixtures to basically give me a nice hierarchical structure. A new list is empty. An empty list retains a single addition, uh, retains unique additions in stack order. A non-empty list is unchanged when head item is re-added, moves non-head item to head when it's re-added. Any list rejects addition of null items, for example. So that would be part of the spec. Uh, there are other ways of arranging this. Again, there are the shoulds and the its, and there are lots of different conventions. I tend to find that most of those, uh, and there's one that occasionally pops up, actually putting the given whens and thens in the names. But I found that in almost all cases, those end up longer or less, um, less wieldy, more unwieldy, um, than trying to express what you're trying to do at this level. Uh, another example that I've, I've found is a very, um, oh yeah, actually I ought to look at the, uh, uh, the body of uh, um, this. So one of the things I can do is, we can see simply um, given when then structure, 
If you don't comment them in, just put blank lines between them because it helps people understand what on earth it is you're trying to do. Um, one of the key properties of this example-based testing approach is that your tests have a very linear narrative. They have a cyclomatic complexity of one. You start at the top and you go. There's no decisions. There's no ifs, else's, fors, switches, whatever. Um, that's a benefit in the sense of it's easy to reason about. This is one of the ways that you know that your tests are more likely to be correct than your code because you can see that they are more likely to be correct. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've all encountered cases where the test, well, I've certainly seen a lot of test cases where the test case is more complex than the thing it's trying to test and therefore is more likely to have bugs in. Um, so Tony Hall, the computer scientist Tony Hall observed you either make something so simple that it is obviously correct or so complex that it is not obviously incorrect. And I've seen a lot of test cases that fall into the second category. The test passes, I think it's okay, but I'm not sure. Um, now, there's a, there, there, there's a, so you end up with a linear narrative. It's worth putting spacing in because you need to break up in, uh, to illustrate this three-part narrative to the reader. Now, as a, uh, a side note, um, a client of mine that uh, a client of mine a few years ago wanted me to review um, their test cases, and uh, they just started unit testing. I said, yeah, fine. And uh, they had three test cases. Test one, test two, I think you know what's coming, test three. So we had the discussion, what is it that test one does? They told me, and I said, well, there you go, there's your name. What is it that test two does? And they said, well, it tests two different things. What do you mean? And I looked at the test code, and it did test two different things. The second half of the test method shared none of the variables of the first half. It really did test two different things. We don't call that test 2A and test 2B. We split it up and you know, name it appropriately. My favorite comment, though, came with test 3. It's when one of the developers sat back and it's kind of like, well, Kevin, this is where your naming scheme doesn't work. I said, why? We don't know what it does. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. You don't know what this does, and that's my problem. Let's be very clear about this. What happens when this test fails? We don't know, <laughs> because we don't know, we don't know what the failure means. And I said, well, this is, even, this is even worse. What happens when it passes? We don't know. What does it mean when this test passes? The only thing that it means is it does whatever it did before. We don't know that whatever it did before is correct, but we know that it's doing whatever it did before, whatever that might be. Um, as a minor point, um, one of the other things I've done here, which I, which I didn't mention, um, uh, this is C-sharp in, in .NET naming style. Um, one does not use underscores like this. Um, but uh, it turns out that human beings are not very good at reading, um, uh, reading Roman alphabet-based systems. Uh, longer than about 20 or 30 characters. So multi-capitalization is a really bad idea above 20 to 30 characters, quite simply because of the way the language is structured and our human perception is structured, even if you can read German. Yeah? Um, I find this is more acceptable to people in the .NET world. When I suggest this in Java, people throw me out of buildings from tall floors. Um, uh, they just need to get over it rather than throwing me out of it. Uh, Plain and simple, people need space separation. The whole case separation thing only works up to 20 characters. It's, a, it's based on a thinking error about how people read. I've got children. I'm, I've, I've, I've learned how kids do and do not read, and it's really not the way we think they read. Um, uh, there's a whole load of visual distinctions that are not significant. Anyway, that's a separate discussion. I, I offer that to you as a consideration, but not as a primary practice. So let me look at something else. Um, Leap years. Now, this is a very simple example. Importantly, it's a non-object example. I want to demonstrate that the same thinking applies. It's not, a, it's not an object thing that your usage of something is in a particular way. Um, uh, this partitioning of tests. If I were to do this in the traditional way, I would have test is leap. That's not how we're going to write it. What is the rule for a leap year? 
determining whether or not is a, a year is a leap year. This is the reason I choose this. Because it turns out that everybody remembers, oh yeah, it's every four years. And then there's some exceptions. And sometimes people remember one or two of the exceptions. Sometimes they misremember one of them. They're not entirely sure. And this is a beautiful example of the, the problem of what do you mean by it works? Because if I just simply have a method called test is leap and it passes, as a reader, I am no wiser as to what the leap year rule is than when I started. The challenge here is not to write code that implements the leap year rule. The challenge is to describe to the reader what the leap year rule is. And the reason that leap year, I, I love the leap year rule because it's a wonderful example of an exception to an exception. Humans are very, very poor with exceptions to rules and very, very poor with exceptions to exceptions to rules. Uh, again, with kids, I noticed this one, uh, uh, see, my older boy a couple of years ago. <coughs> Dad, I know, how many, um, I know how many days there are in a year, he proudly declared. I said, how many? 365. I said, yeah, do you know about leap years? No. Well, every four years, it's 366 days. There's an extra day in February. Oh. He wasn't sure what to do with that. But now he's digested it. He's, you know, 10 years old. He's, that's, he's got that one worked out. My younger one, however, is going through the same process. Dad, a leap year is every four years. Ah, yeah. Except. What do you mean there's an except, Dad? Yeah, except every 100 years. It's divisible by 100. Oh, except. There's an exception to the exception to the exception. Every 400 years. So, a year is a leap year if it is divisible by 4 but not by 100, or if it is divisible by 400. A year is not a leap year if it is not divisible by 4, or if it is divisible by 100 but not by 400. And in this particular example, I tend to, I get people to put a, um, uh, a, a bounding on it. So I basically say common era years, year one onwards. Uh, if, you want to do the f if you want to do the full example, um, because this is the Gregorian rule, if you want to do the full example, it's worth keeping in mind that different countries adopted the Gregorian calendar at different dates. I leave that for you as homework. Okay? So Britain did it in 1752. I think Denmark did it in 1751. I think Russia did it twice in the early 20th century. That's why the October Revolution wasn't in October. Um, uh, Turkey was as late as the 1920s. Um, Sweden is the most interesting case. They, start, they decided um, to adopt the Gregorian calendar one day at a time for, in 1700. They were in the Julian calendar and they thought what we'll do is we'll add a, a day a year and then bring ourselves slowly but surely into alignment with the Gregorian calendar. And this kind of worked okay, except they forgot to do it for a couple of years. And then they reverted back to the Julian calendar, and then they switched a few years later. Uh, to so if you can get Sweden, send me the code, okay? If you can do this locale specific, I'm interested. However, the um, point here is we have a definition of what we mean by a leap year. And as a, as a byproduct, we also have um, a, a, a set of examples um, that uh, would describe it uh, and illustrate it. So... The point here, the challenge here, is not the logic itself, which you can actually express in one line. The challenge to the reader is to understand what do you mean by it works? What is it that it works? It's, uh, you can encounter situations like this, for example, uh, tax rules. They're ridiculously complex. You know, test that tax rules are okay. And there's a whole load of test smells I often, often see. Test that this is successful. Well, great, I wasn't going to test that it wasn't. Test that this is okay. Test that this works okay is one of the ones I've seen. Well, yeah, I mean, good. I wouldn't want to test that it isn't okay. So there is a, there's a point here. However, this applies to functions. Notice that this goes back to this question about um, naming conventions. There is no it in this particular case because there's no object under test. I also find the should definitely doesn't work. A year, sh a year is a, should be a leap year if it is divisible. Well, no, it sh shouldn't be. It is or is not. Yeah? Do or do not, there is no try. Okay? There's no in-between uh, state. But 
the key idea here is this idea of testing as a specification. Now, there's a little bit more to TDD than just that. James Grenning, in his book, Test Driven Development for Embedded C, observed TDD is fun. It's like a game where you navigate a maze of technical decisions that lead to highly robust software while avoiding the quagmire of long debug sessions. With each test, there's a renewed sense of accomplishment and clear progress towards the goal. This idea of progress is important. It is one of the things that drives um, uh, people in programming, the idea of getting meaningful progress as you work. Um, automated tests record assumptions, capture decisions, and free the mind to focus on the next challenge. However, one of the most important things that is overlooked is the first sentence. TDD is fun. There's another point here is that I, I got that feedback once on, uh, uh, in a workshop where somebody sort of said, I didn't realize that testing could be this much fun. I didn't realize that writing code could be this much fun. Often we get into software development because we were quite excited by something. We found something fun at one point, and then we pursued it through perhaps degree and then into work. And somewhere along the line, all the fun got squeezed out of it. And we kind of have to remind ourselves, actually, there's, you know, work and work and play should not be so divorced. TDD, sh there should be something that is fun. But there's another point ab about this, and I want to highlight this um, here. That it goes back to something else I said uh, before. I, I made a throwaway remark about C. People will often find exceptions to why they should not be doing something. Um, this is some very simple C test code. Uh, people often find a, a reason to not do something. One of the most common reasons I find, um, I deal with folks who do embedded work uh, uh, every now and then, and they will say, well, you know, this doesn't work in our environment. And so I quite like the fact that James Groening wrote a book which quite clearly says, you know what, actually you can do it in this. And it does apply to old languages. It's just that culturally there's a different acceptance. What I find is that in, in the Java world, it is much more expected and accepted that unit testing is a normal practice, whereas I find that in um, uh, C and C++, um, it's, culturally, um, uh, uh, it's culturally more awkward. But people assume that that must be a necessary thing, and it, and it certainly isn't. Um, this is just for a, uh, a simple uh, example, um, doing comma-separated variables, which is certainly more challenging in uh, C than it is uh, in other languages because you have buffers that have particular sizes and you have to make sure that you don't overflow a string buffer. Um, and just simply writing out an array of integers as a comma-separated variable string um, has a lot more challenges than in other languages. You want to make sure that if you're writing to null, what happens if you overflow? Do you not write any of the digit or do you truncate the digits? How does this work? So these actually define it. And so what I did um, uh, for this is I took this code and then simply listed the function declaration and then all of those are test names. But what you actually see is that I've just got to remove the underscores. Um, uh, a value to null output writes nothing. No values to sufficient output writes, an empt uh, writes empty. Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, multiple values to insufficient output writes truncated value sequence. So I've, I've defined very clearly what I mean by the behavior in each case. Now there's another thing here that's worth keeping in mind. That's the implementation. Um, um, and uh, there's enough logic in there that I'm satisfied that I've got tests and pleased that I have tests. But I thought for a bit of fun I would mess about with this and rewrite it in C++. The demonstration here is that what I've done is I've just gone and refactored the implementation. The tests are identical. Which brings us to another consideration, uh, refactoring. Uh, I, did this, uh, I did this consultancy. I got a, 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 at a company in uh, northern Germany, and uh, they put the sign on the room that I was doing, you know, I was holding this uh, workshop session in, and they spelled my name wrong. Um, so I put a little arrow before lunch to suggest the change. I came back after lunch. This, this is good. This is not a company. This, as a company, this is pretty cool. You know, if you, put the, if you put a correction on a physical sign and it's fixed when you come back, that's very cool. Um, so you, just, to, just to point out, you don't need refactoring tools to do refactoring. 
so, um, refactoring is best reasoned about by considering what we might sort of consider, well, might talk about as a right hand rule. Um, three dimensions of quality, qualities. Functional qualities of a piece of code, the operational qualities of a piece of code. So the functional qualities are the semantics. The operational qualities are things like memory usage, performance, other aspects of performance, and so on. And then there are developmental qualities. Is the code readable or not? Is it easy to maintain? Is it portable? These are other developmental things. Um, the operational and developmental things, people often merge together as being non-functional. Um, non-functional is a shockingly bad word. Um, I, I, I invite you to never use it again. Um, but if you are going to use it, it's worth checking with a dictionary. The concise Oxford lists non-functional as follows. Having no function. Not in working order. So when somebody says, what are your non-functional requirements? You've either got to be thinking, you know, I, I want it to have a function, or not in working order. Yeah, we want it to break every Tuesday. We want it to crash and burn every Tuesday. There you go, so it's not functioning on Tuesdays. Non-functional shows a profound lack of imagination. We've got two kinds of, uh, we've got these kind of behavioral aspects of the system. Oh, yeah, we've got the functional ones, the semantics. And then we've got these other ones. And tell me about these other ones. What are they? Well, they're not those. Yeah, and they're not those. What are you going to call them? Not those. I went to a zoo the other day. What did you see? I saw elephants. What else did you see? Non-elephants. Yeah? Come on, we can do better than that. As I said, I do care a little bit about words. Um, and this is important when we separate them out, because some of these illities are fundamentally different. Com maintainability has nothing to do with scalability. It's an orthogonal consideration. Developmental qualities are different to these other qualities, which are both runtime qualities. They are experienced at runtime. When I am refactoring, then what I'm doing is I'm focusing on keeping the functional axis fixed. In other words, the semantics are fixed. That CSV example, the CSV behavior is identical regardless of whether I'm using the C example or the C++ example. What I want to do is change the developmental qualities. I want to change something about the way the code is done. The C++ example was simpler than the C example. I may also do this with code that is less than brilliant. I want to be able to take code that is this long and convert it into code that is this long, which is one of those other things about, going back to the comment I said earlier on, people that write a lot of tests tend to write less code. Or rather, they probably write quite a lot of code, but they end up submitting less code in terms of what you actually see. They actually, you actually see the final result is less code. There's probably a lot of activity. Much code has been written. But actually, what, end, what you end up uh, checking in is reduced. Um, now, it's entirely possible that the operational axis will change. The performance will be different. But it might get better, it might get worse. The purpose of refactoring is to keep the functional axis fixed, improve this axis, and this one goes either way. Hopefully not too far either way. If you are optimizing, then that has a different profile. But it is surprisingly similar. It's a behavior-preserving transformation. The functional axis should remain fixed. There's no point in having an optimization that doesn't quite work. You know? Yeah, this runs 10 times faster, but it produces the wrong answer, but 10 times faster. Yeah? So the late John Vercides once uh, had, had the say, you know, our bugs run faster. Um, the point there is you want to preserve the semantics. The operational axis is where you focus your attention, and the developmental axis may go either way. Some optimizations make the code more complex. They handle special cases. Other optimizations actually end up reducing the code. There's this wonderful old saying, um, and it was uh, quoted by a intelligent guide to designing programs. Remember, there is no code faster than no code. The ultimate optimization, yeah? But in many cases, we find there's a reduction. Now, we can go ahead and we can see um, this is, a, this is an implementation of the recently used list uh, that I had uh, 
uh, on one training course. Some of, the, some of the guys on this training course produced this one, and they, I remember they, they sort of said, Kevin, I don't think we've done this right. Um, because actually, to get the exact behavior, you only need this much code. But the point is, you can refactor from the left-hand side to the right-hand side in the presence of tests. In most cases, if I did not have this, if I did not have tests, but I had some kind of indication that the code was correct in its semantics, I would leave this as it is. Because it works, right? Kind of. You know, if I touch it, it might break. So therefore, even at a, even at a code fragment that fits on one slide, I would be reluctant to start changing it. What am I going to do when I'm presented with hundreds of thousands of lines of code? So there's this point of like, there's this kind of um, sense that the code has become the liability. We have not documented the functionality. Let's go back to that quote and realize that your tests are your way of responding to functionality as an asset, in which case, if it's an asset, please tell me what it is. Your tests describe, here is the functionality. Thank you very much. Your code is a liability. Here is the code we produced. You know what? That feels like a first draft. I'm not comfortable with that. But because we've defined what we mean by the functionality, we can work against the asset and reduce the liability. Even in an example as small as this, we actually see that coming to life. Now, the final bit, I want to pick up on that observation of learning about your code. <coughs> Resistentialism, it's a lovely word, it was coined in the 1950s, if I remember correctly. The belief that inanimate objects have a natural antipathy towards human beings, and therefore it is not people who control things, but things which increasingly control people. You may have had days where you feel resistentialism in action, where the objects in your world are resisting you and causing you problems. So, resistentialism uh, raise, just uh, raises the Latin for thing. Um, and thing is a less technical term for object. What kinds of resistentialism do we encounter in software systems? Well, here's one. Singleton. Um, singleton pattern, well, actually, this, is, this, this singleton is actually quite good for your code. Um, it's a single bolt. Um, and uh, what's, what's great is that if you drink a little bit of whiskey whilst considering whether or not to put a global object into your code, it's likely that you will not put the global object in your code. Therefore, this is why I say this is good for your code. Um, Singleton is a, is a menace in, in almost all of its manifestations. Almost. I'm going to say there are a couple of cases where it actually applies. It's just that those aren't the cases that people apply them in. Um, but this, you find out very quickly, um, from a testing point of view, is a pain in the backside. It's not just a problem from a testing point of view. It's a problem in many other cases. It's a problem from concurrency. It is a problem from uh, library separation and reuse. Uh, one of my clients had exactly this situation, but uh, they managed to get rid of almost all of their singletons uh, after I visited them a few times. They managed this. And I remember one visit, they were trying to create a, uh, create a configuration that allowed them to run their server either multi-threaded or as individual multiple processes at the flick of a switch. And it, it turns out that there was, they couldn't do this easily. And it turns out the one remaining singleton in the system was, was preventing them from doing this. In other words, a singleton documents an arbitrary assumption about how something should be executed. And um, unfortunately, it nails it in place. It prevents you doing certain things. So singletons are generally problems um, all over the place. It's not, I don't just object to singletons because of testing. I objected to singletons long before test-driven development. Um, it is that they, uh, become more visible when you test. And in other words, it's not, you're not dealing with the problem because it's a testing problem. You're dealing with the problem because it's a problem and testing has made it visible, which is slightly different. Um, there are, indeed, we find in many other cases, we find that objects are merged together. Um, uh, separation is ultimately the issue. We find classes that are too large, have too many responsibilities, are coupled to too many things. You want to test a piece of logic, but you discover you have to initialize a database. It's not that you never want to test the interaction with the database, but actually that's not the same as testing the individual piece of logic. 
You really want to keep these separate. Here is the logic on which to test. And then here is the interaction between these two things. I would like to integrate that. Knowing that this is most likely correct, then I can, I can be free to test the interaction and understand that if that fails, then it's most likely to be to do with the interaction and not the logic over here. So this idea, um, I also want to step back a little bit from um, the idea that the difficulty of doing a test is just to do with the complexity of your code. Um, that, has become, that has become a kind of common mantra for many people. They, they assume, uh, I've seen that, you know, a lot of very respected individuals uh, who advocate TDD say, if you're, struggle, you know, if you're struggling with your test, then it's a, it's a, it's a sign that you're, there's a problem with your code. That's too simplistic. Um, it's a sign of one of two things. One is complexity, and the other is knowledge, or to be precise, the lack of knowledge, ignorance. And those break out into two cases. So um, the complexity case breaks out into essential and accidental complexity. The essential complexity, right, what is the essential complexity? Uh, how hard is it to write a Hello World program? This isn't a trick question. Yeah? Simple? Good, good. So that has low essential complexity. The nature of the problem is fundamentally simple. Last year, NASA landed a one-ton probe, a roving vehicle, Mars Curiosity, on the surface of Mars, using one of the most preposterous and complicated entry descent landing sequences in the history of spaceflight. Having traveled between the planets, the probe aerobraked in, Mar in Mars's atmosphere. It slowed down by using Mars's atmosphere. The problem is Mars does not have much atmosphere. So it couldn't fully decelerate. So it ejects the heat shield, and then um, out come the supersonic parachutes to slow it down. But the problem is Mars doesn't have much atmosphere. So you jettison those, and you get your secondary parachutes. You're still going quite fast, but here's the next bit. You come down. Um, you then jettison the parachute, and using thrusters, you lower the probe to within about 20 meters of the ground. Whereupon, you lower a one-ton probe, larger than most vans, to the surface using a crane. And then you throw the, uh, you throw the, uh, the, lander, the rest of the lander part away. Basically, it has to jettison itself away. All of this is done automatically, because there is a seven-minute um, uh, 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 light speed difference between here and Mars at that point. So this all has to be operated automatically. How hard is it to do that? It's a little bit harder. Hello Mars is a lot harder than Hello World. Okay? In other words, sometimes it's hard to test something because the problem is fundamentally hard. And I'm sorry there's nothing you can do about that. It's the nature of your work. So, now we've got that one out of the way, let's deal with the three that we can deal with. Because there's the other one, the accidental complexity, which is, it's this hard because we made it this hard. It's this hard because of the architecture. It's this hard because of the code quality. It's this hard because of something that we, and I use it collectively, it may not be you individually, it may be somebody else, it may be the technical choices that are made by somebody you've never met. But ultimately, it is a created thing, and therefore, in theory, it is uncreatable. You can create a different system, a different solution. So that may be a different point. So you need to distinguish between the two kinds of complexity. And then there are two forms of ignorance. Uncertainty over what the code should actually do. Sometimes the challenge is, I have no idea what this is supposed to do. Sometimes people refer to that as a coding problem. It's not a coding problem. It's a fundamental question of requirements and architecture. How is this supposed to work? Now, it turns out that sometimes people are very happy to create fictional behavior. Programmers on a daily basis make up behavior for applications. Ah, oh, what should this do? I think it's logical if it does that. Just remember you are not your users. They do not share your belief in logic. So we make up requirements. It may turn out that the difficulty in writing a test is a difficulty in understanding that you can resolve by going and talking to somebody. <laughs> 
It may also be a lack of testing know-how. Sometimes it's not obvious how to test something. It really is quite hard. It, it, if you don't know about mock objects, then there's a whole class of interactions, inter-object interactions, that are difficult to test. Once you know about mock objects, it becomes easier to test them. If you are testing algorithmic um, code, then the chances are you can't just do a simple assert on a result. Typically, when we're dealing with number crunching, you actually have to do something a little more sophisticated. You have to think around the problem. You have to almost create new testing techniques. So it may be the obstacle is a lack of knowledge and technique. So I'm going to close with this observation from Michael Feathers. In the software industry, we've been chasing quality for years. Interesting things, there are a number of things that work. Um, as I said at the beginning, the uh, testing is not the only game in town, but it's, one, it's part of a, a broader spectrum. All of these techniques have been shown to increase quality, and if we look closely, we can see why. All of them force us to reflect on our code. There's this other thing when people say, testing will slow me down. It turns out that what, sometimes when people ask me this, they're hoping that I'll say, no, it won't, it'll speed you up. They're very disappointed when I say, yes, you're right, it will slow you down. But it'll slow you down in a good way, because it'll force you to reflect on your code. Um, there is a, a friend, I don't know if he's still alive. You'll understand why in a moment. Um, I knew him just over 20 years ago. Um, and, well, let's try and understand. There's a very simple and obvious answer to the following question. Why do cars have brakes? I want the simple and obvious answer that is correct. So you can stop. That is simple, obvious, and correct. There is another answer that is more subtle and is also correct. Cars have brakes so you can go faster. I want you to consider for a moment how fast you would go if you did not have brakes in a car. My friend, Alan, drove from London to Brighton, which would normally take you uh, about an hour and a half. From yeah, about an hour and a half. In a car with no brakes, no working foot brake. This is why I wonder whether or not he's still alive. I've been in a car with Alan when he did have brakes, and that, quite frankly, was scary enough. But the idea of him driving a car without... It took him hours. It took him absolutely ages because he had to take all the back roads. He had to use hills, careful gear changing, and the handbrake at various points to do this. This is an insanely dangerous way of driving. So when we talk about the idea that tests will slow you down, yes, tests are your brakes. They will allow you to go faster for the very reason that they slow you down. And that is a sort of fairly key observation. So that's the magic. That's why unit testing works. When you write tests, TDS style or after your development, you scrutinize, you think, and often you prevent problems without ever encountering a test failure. Sometimes people are disappointed because they think of tests only in the context of quantitative feedback. In other words, I am testing my code. I expect to find bugs because then I know my testing is good. It's really disappointing when... I wrote my code, I wrote my tests, and I didn't find anything. Well, those tests are useless. You know, why did I bother? It, that's the wrong way of approaching it. But still, many people approach it like that. So, on that note, it is lunch. And I am around for today and tomorrow. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much for your time.